So today we will be uh, reviewing for exam number four. We have a test this Thursday. I will be uploading it at um, six o'clock. You'll have till eight o'clock to turn it in. Um, again, um, best way to use this video is when you get to the problems, try them on your own. You try them um, and then hit play and see uh, what it is that I did. Um, we started in section 9.9 .9. and in section 9.9 .9, we were using the formula for a geometric series to create um, our, own geom our, our own series, right? And so we have the formula that um, a plus a times r plus a times r squared plus dot 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 uh, is a geometric series converges to the first term a all over one minus the common ratio and so um, if we have expressions that look like this then we can back substitute and get a series right um, but because of the squared and all this here um, what we might want to do is use partial fraction decomposition to get to linear terms uh, on this problem so what we have is 4x over x squared plus 2x minus 3, which can be rewritten as um, 4x over x plus 3, x minus 1, which then we know to be uh, able to be broken up as something a over x plus 3 plus b over x minus 1 and we need to figure out the a and b uh, we get that by multiplying both sides of the equation by x plus 3 times x minus 1 um, which will then give us that 4x will have to equal a times x plus 3 I'm sorry a times x minus 1 the x plus 3 will go away uh, plus b times uh, x plus 3 the x minus 1 will go away. Um, letting x equal 1, um, then on the left we will get 4, and on the right we will get 4b, so then we will get that b equals 1. Uh, letting x equal negative 3, then on the left we will get negative 12, and on the right we will get negative 4a. And so then we get that a is equal to positive 3. And so then um, what we're trying to do is find a uh, power series centered at c. So c is 0. So that means we want uh, the r here to be in terms of just x, a factor of x, something times x. Right, so if it was at c equals 1, then we would want a factor of x minus 1. Um, if it was uh, uh, c equals 5, then we would want a factor of x minus 5. Um, but we want 0, so we just want a factor of x. Okay, um, and so now we just figured out that uh, a is 3. So we have uh, 3 over... Uh, x plus 3. Let me go ahead and write this as uh, uh, instead of x plus 3, 3 plus x. And so again, trying to match the, the formula over here, um, what we want is we want our first term here to be 1. And since our first term here is uh, 3, well, we can do that easy enough by just multiplying the numerator and denominator by one third. Now, when I graded your homework, um, lots of you just jumped right to um, the, the uh, um, next or the final stage uh, without showing me any work. And I can't do this in my head. And if I can't do it in my head, then I don't expect you to be able to do it in your head. And I'm going to assume that you just copied. Um, so if um, you want to skip some steps, that's perfectly fine. 
but you need to make sure that you show me enough steps so that I don't think you're copying or looked it up online somewhere. Um, so yeah, so this one is fine. Um, and so once we do that, then we get uh, 1 over uh, 1 uh, plus x over 3. And um, the formula calls for a minus, which this, you know, if you skipped this step, this would be fine. But you have to show me that you'd multiply top and bottom by one third. Um, and then this becomes one minus negative x over three, which then means that applying this formula over here, the a is one and the r is negative x over three. And so then this is a. Uh, uh, a geometric series, so it's the summation from i equals 1 to infinity of um, the first term is a, which is 1, and your common ratio is just negative x over 3 uh, to the i power. Okay. Uh, for your other one, for your other uh, um, b over x minus 1, and b was 1, 1 over x minus 1, 1 over, um, and again, I will write it as negative 1 plus x. And again, what I need here is I need this first term here to be a 1, so I can do that by just multiplying the numerator and denominator by negative 1. which then leaves me with negative 1 over uh, 1 minus x. And then you can see that um, it matches the formula perfectly. Um, we've just replaced the a with negative 1 and the r with x. So then this will equal the summation from i equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 times x to the i from i equals oh i'm sorry this shouldn't be from from 1 this should be to 0 from 0 to infinity right that's how you're going to get that first term and there you go um and so now um then the 4x over x squared plus 2x minus 3 is equal to the uh, 3 over x plus 3. Uh, plus the 1 over x minus 1. Um, and we have summations for those. So those are the summations uh, from i equals 0 to infinity uh, from of negative 1 x to the i uh, plus the summation from i equals 0 to infinity of negative x over 3 to the i. And um, now um, this one will converge whenever your common ratio is between negative 1 and 1. So your common ratio is negative x over 3 and that has to be between negative 1 and 1 and it will diverge otherwise because that's what geometric series do. This means that your x um, has to be between negative 3 and 3. And so there's your interval of convergence for that one. Um, but for this one, um, your common ratio is x, and so then that will only converge when your x is between negative 1 and 1. So the only way the sum is going to converge is if your x's lie between um, um if your x's lie between 
uh, negative 1 and 1, whatever they have in common. So negative 1 and 1. Okay. And if you notice, these are like terms. So we can uh, rewrite this as one summation, summation from i equals 0 to infinity. And if we just factor out the x to the i, um, you get a negative uh, 1 uh, plus negative 1 third to the i, x to the i. And this is your interval of convergence. So I will try and spell that out for you that you need to give me the interval of convergence. You can't just give me, um, you can't just um, uh, give me the series. You have to give me the interval of convergence. And so there you go. That's how you do that. Okay. We went on to section 9.10 and in section 9.10, um, we went over how to uh, uh, derive uh, McLaurin and Taylor series uh, from the definition as well as um, as well as um, um, using known series to make other series right and so we'll, we'll do some problems like that so use Sigma notation to write the McLaurin series for the function. So um, again, uh, this is implying that you derive the function from the definition. I will make that clear on your on your um, instructions. Uh, this is not just go and look up the series and write it down. Y your test will be open note, open book. Um, but you're not. Please don't go and Google the answers. And so to um, the McLaurin series, we. Uh, look for some pattern recognition by making a table that, that, that I showed you guys. Uh, your left column is n. Your next column is the nth derivative of your function at x. Then you're going to evaluate that at 0. And you're going to use this table to figure out what your cn is. And the formula for your cn is that it's just the nth derivative evaluated at 0 divided by n factorial. So when n is 0, you're just dealing with the natural log of 1 plus x. And I expect to see all this work, right? I expect to see the table. I expect to see um, um, uh, your, your derivation, not just your series. When you plug in 0 into this, you get the natural log of 0. I'm sorry, natural log of 1, which is 0. And so then your c0, your constant term, is just 0. When n is 1, you've taken the first derivative, and the derivative of the, nat uh, the natural log of 1 plus x is 1 over 1 plus x, or 1 plus x to the negative 1 will make it easier to take more derivatives. And then when we evaluate that at 0, we get 1 to the negative 1. 1 to any power is 1. And um, then c1, following this formula right here, is your output here, 1 divided by 1 factorial, 1, so you get 1. You're going to do enough of these until you see a pattern so that you can write this in summation notation. 2 is not enough to see a pattern. Uh, so we move on to when n is 2, you're going to bring down the exponent, negative 1. I take 1 away from the exponent, negative 2 times the derivative of the inside, but the derivative of the inside is uh, a 1, so nothing there. When we plug in 0 for x, when we replace that x with 0, we get 1 to the negative 2, but 1 to any power is 1 with a negative in front, and you get negative 1. And so then um, c2 is 1 divided by 2 factorial. Following this formula, your output is 0 divided by n factorial. And so then 2 factorial is 2, and so then you get one half. Oh, I'm sorry. Negative. Negative one half. Okay. When n is three, um, you're going to bring down that negative two. That's going to make it a positive two, and you'll get one plus x to the negative three times the derivative of the inside. You just get uh, one. 
When you plug in 0, you're going to get 1 to the negative 3, which is 1, times 2 is 2. And the, so then your C3 will be your positive 2 divided by 3 factorial, which is 2 over uh, 6, which reduces down to 1 third. And so then when n is 4, um, you'll bring down the exponent, and now you'll get negative 6. Take 1 away from the exponent, 1 plus x to the negative 4, and multiply by the derivative of the inside, 1, so that stays the same. When you plug in 0, you're going to get negative 6. 1 to any power is 1. So then your c4 is going to be the negative 6, which is also negative 3 factorial. Uh, divided by uh, 4 factorial, which is 24. And you see that what happens is this reduces down to one, negative 1 quarter. And finally, this is enough. You're, you're seeing a pattern emerging. Um, you bring down this uh, negative 4, you'll get positive 24. 1 plus x to the negative 5. When you plug in 0, you'll get uh, 24. And what you should notice is that these are the factorials, just one behind. So it's not n factorial, it's n minus 1 factorial. And so then your C5 is really 4 factorial divided by 5 factorial, which then uh, the 4 factorial cancels out, and you end up with just 1 fifth. You could also see that it's alternating, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. And we, um, we um, don't start at 0 because um, the, the constant term is 0. We can start at 1. If you want to start at 0, you can, but there's absolutely no need. So this is the summation uh, from uh, k or uh, from k equals 0. I'm sorry, from k equals 1 uh, to infinity. And you can see that um, your coefficients are just going to be uh, 1 over uh, k, and then it's x to the n, and then um, it alternates. So you have this factor of negative 1, and you were starting out positive, so you need a k plus 1 on there. And there you go. Uh, find the interval of convergence, right? So we have the summation. Um, from k equals 1 to infinity of uh, negative 1 to the k plus 1. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, negative 1 to the k plus 1, x to the k over k. So um, the way we find the interval of convergence on these problems is using the ratio test. Using the ratio test, we take the limit as uh, n goes off to infinity of the a sub n plus 1 divided by the a sub n. So then we take the limit as n goes off to infinity of, uh, I'm sorry, the absolute value. When you absolute value, that this factor here, when you absolute value either a negative 1 or a positive 1, you get a 1. So that just goes away. The only other thing the absolute value does is it just everything else is positive except this could be positive or negative so then that becomes uh, positive. So then this becomes the absolute value of x to the k plus 1 over k plus 1 times the reciprocal of the a sub n which is the uh, absolute value of x. I'm sorry, the, this should be a n. absolute value of x to the n. I'm sorry, we're supposed to multiply by the reciprocal, not the same. We're dividing, so instead of uh, uh, dividing, we multiply by the reciprocal. So we end up with n over the absolute value of x to the n. Here you can subtract the exponents with this one and this one, and you just end up with the absolute value of x. And with these, since they have the same degree, as n goes off to infinity, that limit is 1. So your limit is the absolute value of x. And so then, um, according to the ratio test, uh, it converges 
uh, for the absolute value of x is less than 1, which implies that um, um, x is between negative 1 and 1, this series will converge. Um, but when, and it all, the ratio test also tells you that if you use uh, numbers outside of this interval, numbers that are bigger than 1 or less than negative 1, it tells you that the series diverges. But um, if you use either 1 or negative 1, your limit is exactly positive 1. And so then the test is inconclusive. So you need to test the endpoints. So it's important that you test the endpoints. If x equals negative 1, now then you end up with the summation um, from k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the k plus 1 times negative 1 to the k, all divided by k. Here you add the exponents, and this becomes the summation from k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the 2k plus 1, all divided by k. And that 2k plus 1 is always odd. And one negative 1 to an odd power will always be negative. So this is then the summation from k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 over k, which diverges, because that's just the harmonic series. So that diverges. Now, if uh, x equals, well, let me go ahead and come up here. If x equals positive 1, uh, then we get the series, the summation, from k equals 1 to infinity of um, negative 1 to the k plus 1 all divided by k. And this converges by alternating series test. And so then your interval of convergence, IOC, it will converge for everything between negative 1 and 1. And it will also converge for exactly ne a, a positive 1, but will diverge for negative 1. And there you go. And um, so what does that mean? That means that you can pick any number uh, between uh, negative 1 and 1, including 1, put it into the series, and as you add more and more terms, the series will go somewhere. It will converge. Um, and what we learned in this section also is that it converges to um, the original function. So the natural log of 1 plus x is equal to, so it's the same thing as this infinite polynomial from k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 uh, x to the k over k. Okay. So now this says find the exact value of, this is the alternating harmonic series. Um, and we know this converges, but we didn't say what it converged to. And if you notice, um, your series was the natural log of k plus 1 is equal to uh, the summation from k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the k plus 1 um, x to the k all over k. And um, this right here, you get by letting x equal 1, the natural log of x plus 1, I'm sorry. So all I've done is taken uh, this series and replaced x with 1. So I can get this value by going to my formula and replacing x with 1. So this is the natural log of 1 plus 1, which is the natural log of 2. So that series converges to the natural log of 2. It actually turns out to converge very slowly, so it's going to take it some time. You may need a thousand terms to get very accurate, but it will converge to the natural log of 2.
So, so uh, here we have some important McLaurin series. You have uh, um, all these series that you can use, and we can use these series to make other series. So if I ask you to do that, you can do that. So find the Taylor series for the natural log of x using the McLaurin series for the natural log of 1 plus x. So we just derived the formula for the natural log of 1 plus x. Um, it is uh, this thing. And um, so now we can make substitutions into this to, to uh, find functions for something else. So we want to uh, find um, a, a, a Taylor series for the natural log of x. And so then what we can do is um, we can just replace this x right here with x minus 1. So the natural log of x is the natural log of 1 plus uh, x minus 1. See, when I combine this and this, we'll just get the natural log of x. So then all I can do now is then take this x minus 1 and put it right there, and then I will have my series. This is the summation from k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the k plus 1. And then I get, um, instead of x, I get x minus 1 to the k, all divided by um, k. Okay. Um, now, this interval of convergence is very important, interval of convergence. The number that you put in into this formula has to be between negative 1 and 1. This is what we put in. So x minus 1 has to be between negative 1 and 1. And um, then we can uh, add 1 to all three sides to figure out what values of x we can use. And we will get 0 needs to be less than x, which needs to be less than or equal to 2. So that's your interval of convergence for this Taylor series. And um, there we go. Uh, find the Taylor series for 1 over x using the Taylor series for the natural log of x. So what we're going over right now is how to use um, a known Taylor series to find another one. So we just figured out that the Taylor series for the natural log of x is the summation uh, from k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the k plus 1, um, x minus 1 to the k, all divided by k. And we want to use this series um, to figure out uh, the Taylor series for 1 over x. Um, well, we can do that because uh, 1 over x is the derivative of the natural log of x. And since the natural log of x is this series, this is the derivative of the summation from k equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the k plus 1, x minus 1 to the k over k. And we can do this term by term. That We have a theorem from 9.9 that says we can do this term by term. And so when we take the derivative of this and bring it down, the k's will go away. And so then this will just be the summation from k equals 1 to infinity of um, negative 1 uh, to the k plus 1. And then um, x minus 1 to the k minus 1, all divided by, oh, that's it, because the k's will go away. And there we go.
Um, the only thing, the uh, interval of convergence is not preserved. The radius of convergence is. Um, and so here, we don't have to start all over to look for the interval of convergence. We just got to look at the endpoints, right? And so um, we know that the, 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 the radius of convergence, um, uh, we know that this thing converges definitely uh, from 0 is less than x, which is less than 2. Um, but we don't know what happens at the endpoints. And you can see that um, if you put in 0 for x, um, you will get this series. If x equals 0, um, you get this series, the summation uh, of negative 1 uh, to the k plus 1 times negative 1 uh, to the k minus 1. And you can see that the terms do not go to 0, so it diverges. And the same thing is going to happen if x equals 2. If x is 2, you get the summation of negative 1 uh, to the k. Uh, because 2 minus 1 is 1, and 1 to any power is 1. Um, and so then you get negative 1 to the k plus 1. I'm sorry, plus 1. And so then uh, the terms there don't go to 0, so that diverges. So your interval of convergence is um, not does not include the 2 now. It's just from 0 to 2, not including either of them. Okay. So... Um, yeah, you need to be careful with those. You have to retest the endpoints because they, they may converge and may diverge. Um, so one of the things we can do with this is we can approximate uh, different things. We can replace a complicated function that we can't uh, work with um, with a simpler function, right? So. Um, this should have a dx, I'm sorry. So all I'm going to ask you to do, um, uh, when I ask you to approximate, is I want you to use the first four non-zero terms. I'm not going to go over any of the numerical analysis with how many terms do I need to be within a certain error. I'll let, uh, I'll let your numerical analysis people deal with that. Um, we're just going to use four non-zero terms, right? Um, and so this function here does not have an antiderivative, but what we could do is we could replace it with uh, the first four terms of the Maclaurin series for it, and we can get the Maclaurin series for it simply by making a substitution into this one. So uh, the sine of x is up there, so the sine of x squared, we can just replace the x with x squared, so the first term will be x squared, minus replacing this x with x squared would give us x to the sixth, over 3 factorial is 6 plus uh, x to the 15th, I'm sorry, x to the 10th. Placing x with x squared gives us x to the 10th over 5 factorial is 120. And then um, that should be enough, right? So I'm only going to use uh, the first three terms from there. It's getting pretty, uh, pretty small. So then the integral from 0 to 1 of the sine of x squared is just, it can be approximated by the antiderivative, I'm sorry, the definite integral from 0 to 1 of x squared minus x to the 6th over 6 plus x to the 10th over 120. I'm sorry, I forgot the dx again, dx, dx. And the point is these are now basic power functions, so this antiderivative is x cubed over 3. Uh, this one is x to the uh, seventh over 42. And this one is x to the 11th 
over 11 times 120. And we're going to evaluate this from 0 to 1. At 0, you get 0. At 1, you get uh, 1 third minus 1 over 42 plus 1 over 11 times 120. Thirteen twenty, and so if you punch that into the calculator, one third minus one over forty two plus one over thirteen twenty, uh, we get point uh, three one zero. I used the graphing calculator to approximate this, and um, it was correct to the hundredths place um, with only three non-zero terms, and it was pretty easy to do. So that's the point of this. Okay. We moved on to chapter 10, and we talked about um, uh, parametric equations. Um, I expect you to be able to graph parametric equations by making a table and also by eliminating the parameter. Uh, so to make a table here, you're plotting in the xy plane. So you get your xy points by using values of t that are reasonable. From your work in trigonometry, you should know that to graph the sine and cosine function, you use the quadrant angles. So that's what we're going to use for t is the quadrant angles. 0, pi over 2, pi. 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. And the cosine of uh, 0 is 1, times 3 is 3, plus 2 is 5. Sine of 0 is uh, 0, minus 4, I'm sorry, negative 4 plus 0 is negative 4. At pi over 2, the cosine is 0, and so... Um, we get uh, just 2 for x, uh, but the sine is 1, so we get negative 4 plus 5 is 1. At pi, um, the cosine is negative 1, so you get 2 plus negative 3, which is negative 1. And um, the sine is uh, 0, so you get negative 4. The sine of pi is 0, and negative 4 plus 0 is negative 4. At 3 pi over 2, the cosine is 0, so 2 plus 0 is still 2. And then the uh, sine is um, negative 1. So you get negative 4 plus negative 5, which is negative 9. And then at 2 pi, uh, cosine of 2 pi is 1, times 3 is 3, plus 2 is 5. And the sine of 2 pi is 0, so you get negative 4. So um, 5, negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then 2, 1, 1, 2, 1. And then negative 1, 4, negative 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then, I'm sorry, negative 1, negative 4. That was off. Negative 1, negative 4. One, two, and then 2, negative 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then um, we get back to where we started, 5, negative 4. See, we're just going around, so it seems reasonable that we get a nice curve. This is an ellipse. And the orientation is we started here and went around in this direction. To remove the parameter, we can use the um, trigonometric identity that the sine squared of t plus the cosine Square root of t is equal to 1. And so then we can take this and solve for the cosine of t. And so then um, 
this gives us the cosine of t is equal to uh, x minus 2 divided by 3. Uh, solving this one for the sine of t will give us that the sine of t is equal to y plus 4 uh, divided by 5. And plugging these expressions in to the here and to here it gives us our rectangular equation. Uh, y plus 4 over 5 squared plus x minus 2 over 3 squared equals 1. And from that, you should recognize that as the graph of an ellipse. We went over how to do some calculus with these things. And so um, for the derivative, um, for the curve defined by the parametric equations x equals f of t and y equals g of t, the derivative is defined by the parametric equations, right? Um, so what the derivative does is it associates with each x-coordinate a, um, a um, slope of a tangent line. And so if you have parametric equations for a, fun for a curve, then your derivative should be a set of parametric equations because you're associating with each x-coordinate a uh, slope of a tangent line. Um, and so then it, it's important to know this because when you take the second derivative, you follow the same formula, that the second derivative is the derivative of your derivative divided by the derivative of your x-formula. So let's apply that here. Uh, for the curve below, find the point on the curve corresponding to t equals 2. Find the slope of the tangent line. Is the graph concave up or concave down? All right, so you have your, your, your uh, curve is defined by a set of parametric equations. So to find uh, your, your point, you use those to figure out um, what is your um, x and your y coordinate. So then your point. Uh, x is equal to 2 squared minus 4, which is 0. y is equal to 2 cubed minus 3t. I'm sorry, minus 3 times 2, uh, which is 8 minus 6, which is 2. And so your point, you are at the point 0, 2. Uh, we would like to know the slope of the tangent line at that point. So then that's given to us by our derivative, dy dx. Um, but this is dy dt divided by dx dt so that we don't have to eliminate the parameter. We can just use this. Uh, dy dt is uh, 3t squared minus 3. And dx dt is 2t. Now, if we wish, we can rewrite this as um, 3 halves uh, t minus 3 halves t to the negative 1. Okay. So dy dx evaluated at t equals 2. Um, we just put 2 in for t. And um, we get uh, 3 halves times 2 minus 3 halves times 1 over 2, which is 3 minus 3 quarters. Okay. Now, for our second derivative, this is what's a little confusing for people. Because um, they just figure, okay, well, I have the first derivative here. Take the first derivative of that. But remember, your first derivative is also a set of parametric equations. So for your second derivative, you have to follow that same format of taking the derivative of your first derivative, 
this thing, which is just going to be three halves, uh, my plus um, three halves t to the negative two, and dividing it by uh, the derivative of your x formula, and that one doesn't change. So your x formula was t squared minus 4, so that would still just be 2t. And d squared y divided by d x squared, the second derivative, evaluated at t equals uh, 2. Um, we don't care what it is. We just want to know if it's concave up or concave down. And you can see that in this expression here, when you put in 2, there's absolutely no place for a negative number to come in. So that's going to be greater than 0. Therefore, concave up. You can um, plug it in if you like, get an exact number, but there's no need. We went on to talk about uh, polar curves and how to graph them and how to do some calculus with them. Um, a graph is given in rectangular theta r coordinate system. Uh, sketch the corresponding graph and polar coordinates. Right. So if you're relying on just your calculator to make your polar curves, I could render your calculator useless. So you need to be careful with that. Okay. So let's start here. Um, we need to plot that point that corresponds to a theta value of 0 and an r value of 2. Theta value of 0 means that you've rotated the x-axis nothing and you've gone out 2 units. So you're right here. Right? Now, um, as theta increases from 0 to pi over 2, your r value increases from an r value of 2 to an r value of 4. And so then you're connecting uh, this point down here with this point up here, and that keeps track of this part of the graph. Doing something like that. Now from pi over 2 to pi, from pi over 2 to pi, um, you are uh, coming back down um, to an r value of 2. So this point right here corresponds to uh, angle of pi, you've rotated a pi and you've walked out two units along that. So you're right there. And so then you're connecting this point up here to this point down here. And so that would look like this. That takes care of this part. Now your r value is always positive. And as you're going from pi to 3 pi over 2, your r value comes down to 0. So uh, this point right here, 3 pi over 2, 0, is where you're at the pole. You're here. And so you started out here, and your r value is getting smaller. And so you are connecting that right there. And then finally, um, from here to here, I'm um, sorry, from here back to here, from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, um, your r value goes from 0 back to 2. And this point right here, 2 pi 2, is this point here, and you're just filling out the rest of that. And there is your graph. Find polar coordinates of all points at which the polar curve has a horizontal or a vertical tangent line. Okay, so... Um, when you have a polar curve, um, you can parameterize it by using the fact that your x is always r times the cosine of theta. And uh, so in this case, since r is a times 1 plus cosine theta, then this will be a times 1 plus cosine theta times the cosine of theta. Your y is r sine theta. Um, and so then this will be a times uh, 1 plus cosine theta sine theta. There is a stray parenthesis. Um, for differentiation purposes, we should probably expand this. Um, I'll just leave the a outside because it's a constant. 
and you'll get cosine theta plus cosine squared theta. And then here you'll get a uh, cosine sine theta plus sine theta cosine theta. Now, um, since dy dx will equal dy dr divided by dx dr, um, this will have a horizontal tangent line where dy dr is 0 and dx dr is not. It will have a vertical tangent line where dx dr is 0 and, d, uh, and dy dr is not. So horizontal we figure out what's a dy dr. So dy dr is um, a times the derivative of the inside. Um, it's just a constant times whatever the derivative of all this is. This is a sum. So the derivative of the sine is just the cosine. Uh, but the second term is a product. So we have to use the uh, product rule. And so when we use the product rule, um, we get the sine, third of the sine is the cosine, so you get cosine squared minus uh, sine squared. When you take the derivative of the cosine, you get the sine, I'm sorry, the minus sine, you already have that there. Okay. And um, since we have two trig functions, and since this, since we already have the cosine of theta here, what we can do is we can replace the sine squared of theta with one minus the cosine squared of theta. which will then um, be a times um, the, uh, when we distribute, we'll get two cosine squared theta uh, plus the cosine of theta minus one. We could then factor, leave that a outside that's just a trinomial to cosine theta, cosine theta, and then uh, plus and minus, and then one and one. Uh, but this gives me cosine theta minus two cosine theta. That gives me minus cosine theta. I got the signs wrong. So this should be minus one, and this should be plus one. Now these two will give me minus cosine theta, and these two will give me plus two cosine theta, and I will get my cosine theta. So then um, the zeros of this will happen where the cosine of theta is equal to negative one, or um, where the cosine of theta is equal to one half. Uh, for, uh, so for this one, uh, theta is equal to pi, and for this one, uh, theta is equal to um, 30, 60, 90 triangle, 60 degrees, 30 degrees, 1, 2, square root of 3. And so if we want the cosine to be a half, we're looking at pi over 3. But we're also then in quadrant 4, uh, 5 pi over 3 one-third away from two. Um, you do the same thing for the uh, for dx d theta. I'm sorry, d, dx dr and see what makes that. I'm sorry, this should have been dy d theta, not dr. And dx d theta, your parameter is theta, not r. Right, and um, so you uh, um, you do the same thing, dy d theta. 
um, you do the same thing for the other one and you can figure out what makes that zero.